is Karen? So then I started digging deep and I found out who Karen is. And y'all, it's actually like a really odd story. Giraffe Manor, that hotel that y'all see all over Instagram with like the giraffes hanging out the room, like eating people's food, like drinking the tea with you with the people with like the white towels and just living lavish vacation vibes. That's in Karen, right? Yes, that's the one. Um, it's located in Karen, which the government named after her. The Kenyan government did name that after her. She did not name it after herself, obviously. I've been to Karen hella times. I thought maybe she just ran like a successful coffee farm. They just liked her a lot. Like maybe she had donated a lot to Kenya. I don't know, but like... This is the residential area of Karen that is located in the city of Nairobi. It is towards the north side of the city in a very plush green area. As y'all can see by just looking at these drone shots, most of the homes there are huge homes, very residential. You got to have a bag to live here. You really do. So this is the area in which I will be referring to throughout the duration of this video, just to add some context for you guys a little. So let's just dive straight in. Let's just dive straight into the story. Karen Denson was born on April the 17th, 1885, making her an Aries. So if you guys know anything about Aries, you kind of already know how this story is gonna go. Hmm. She was born into a wealthy Danish family in Runstead, Denmark. Her father's name was Wilhelm Denson, and her father was a well-known army officer who like rubbed elbows with a lot of noblemen and like royal people from that time, but he was not like technically a part of the royal court. You know what I'm saying? So he eventually became a parliamentarian man, which is like a congressman. That's what we call them today. Um, but he left that position to travel throughout the world and he became an explorer. So if you guys know anything about that time, it's like the Gilded Age, the age of colonism on the rise and all that going on. So her mom's name was Ingborg Westenholz, very interesting names. She too came from money. So her mom's family owned a lot of ships. They were really heavy into politics and shipping goods from Europe to the Americas. Her mom was on like the Women's Council of Government in Denmark as well. She was very politically active up until the time that she met Will, her man, Karen's dad, and then they began to like have children. Then she became a stay-at-home mom and like wife to her husband, like a good old girl was supposed to do at that time, right? But her husband was never really home. That was a big problem for them. Karen's dad actually traveled all the way to North America and worked as a fur trapper among the Chippewa Native Americans, which is like around the area of what is Wisconsin today, the state of Wisconsin. So like, you know, you get married, you think everything's going to be sweet. It wasn't really the way that she thought it was going to be. So while he was there, he was fur trapping, studying Native Americans, and let's just say, like, the studying is very a loose term. Like, he was studying, you know what I'm saying? So, um, he ended up having a baby on Karen's mom with a Native American. So, issue started once he realized he had impregnated a Native American Indian. And he, he also ended up contracting syphilis while he was in North America. Like, it's just a hot mess situation. So he did end up going back to Denmark to his family with his tail in between his legs. And he was honest with his wife about what had happened. And his wife forgave him. Very sweet girl. She did forgive him, but like mentally, he just couldn't get over the fact that he had syphilis. So he ended up killing himself when Karen was only 10 years old. So one of the classic symptoms of syphilis at this time was eventually going like mad in the head and he didn't want to end his life in like mental delirium and like being mentally incapable so he just like ended the story there for himself he cut things off cold turkey like it was just a hot mess so this left karen's mom to take care of her 
and her siblings all by herself. Um, this wasn't the most awful situation for Karen's mom, only because at the end of the day, I mean, like, she was rich without her husband and she was even richer with him gone, you know, because what's his was hers and now what's hers was hers. So Karen was able to, like, attend the finest schools that Europe had to offer at the time. She went to school in Rome. She went to school in Paris. She went to school in Copenhagen, like all these places. And then she eventually picked up a love for painting and began to write. So she wrote like a lot of different type of books, poems, editorials, things in newspapers. And she began to learn how to write in a lot of different languages as well. So at the age of 20, she began to publish stories under a pseudonym um, Oskiola. She wanted to use a pseudonym because at that time, women just were not like respected. But the weird plot twist of it all is that Oskiola was a seminal leader back in North America. So it's just random that she chose this name to use as like a homage almost to her dad's trek to the Americas. I don't know if it had to do with like dedication to her little half Native American sibling that she had out there. Like, I don't really know, but she did go by a Native American man's name as a pseudonym for her writing. So she gets to like the end of her 20s and decides that it's time for her to like find love, find happiness, settle down. And Miss Karen, little Miss Karen went on a manhunt, you know? She wanted something new. So she went to Sweden to get to know her dad's side of the family because, you know, after her dad died, they kind of had like lost that connection with her dad's side of the family. So many people in her dad's family were all around the world. Like they were explorers, it wasn't just her dad. So then she found out that she actually had family in Africa, you know? And she was really intrigued by this. She decided to try something new and she got like a lot of creative inspiration from the thought of going to Africa. So in 1913, she took a ship from Naples to Kenya. And once she arrived to Kenya, she was really amazed and like in awe of exactly how gorgeous it really was there. Like it was everything that she was expecting. The future was bright for her there. Like she just knew it. So she ended up falling in love with one of her second cousins, Hans Gustav von Blixen. So Hans had like common sense and was like, girl, you're my cousin. Like, this is awkward. No, I'm not really feeling the vibe. But thankfully for Karen, um, all was not lost. And he had a twin brother who was actually like into being with Karen. So Broer Von Blixen and Karen ended up getting married and like riding off into the sunset with one another, which is exactly what she wanted. The marriage was extremely political and strategic. I mean, they did like love each other, but they also knew that they had a lot of other reasons to be together that were just like, making sense like they both came from good families they both were interested in staying in africa and kenya which not too many people were at the time and then it also allowed her to acquire the title of baroness which like advanced her family and herself politically so now she really did have like a a royal title so his title and her money provided like the perfect life for them to be like high society of the British settlers that were slowly building a large community in Kenya at this time. So they celebrated their wedding in Mombasa. They used their wedding money to buy 6,000 acres in a very plush part of Nairobi. And then they created Karen's Coffee Company and began to try to export coffee. So FYI, I've been working on my Swahili. So the the way that you say coffee farm in Swahili is Kahawa Shamba. Kahawa means coffee and Shamba means farm. Talk to me back for me. So things were going really good for them. Settlers were coming in left and right, and they were just really like becoming a part of the budding community that would eventually take over and colonize all of Kenya, which is really awful. But um, at this time, World War I was breaking out in Europe, so it was a great place for Europeans to kind of like escape like the direct fire of war and like all those ghetto ass issues that came along with world war one if you were living in europe at that time because it really became like a war zone so karen's husband Brewer ended up enlisting with the british army even though he had escaped to kenya because they were fighting in east africa as well so karen being the sweet and loving wife that she was 
would like take off on her little wagon with food and head for like different locations throughout Kenya to bring her husband and his soldier friends like food and supplies, which is real sweet because I ain't doing all that. But she held down the farms that were around her own farm for single men who had to abandon their farms to go fight throughout East Africa as well. So she was just like the perfect wife living like the perfect life in this perfect country with her perfect husband on their perfect farm and like living in a fantasy. But the fantasy would soon end and it got dark real quick. So you know how they say like, sometimes you end up marrying your dad. I know it's weird, but like people say that, like not literally marrying your dad, but like you find a guy who's very similar to like the characteristics that you have in your dad. Well, Karen's husband, Broer, was very similar to her dad. And it's actually really, it's fucking weird. So after he returned home from war, he began to travel a lot, like hosting safaris, going on adventures throughout Kenya. Like, I can't blame him, to be honest, because Kenya's lit as fuck. So I can only like really imagine. But I wouldn't want to like sit around on a coffee farm all day either if like there's a lot of fun to be had. So he went on multiple like month long safaris all the time, which is crazy to me because I've been on safari in Kenya and I can't do it past like five hours. So if my husband came home like, baby, I'm going on the safari. I'll be back in a month. I would like major kind of side eye. Hmm. And I'm sure she was. So he caught syphilis on one of his safari trips during their marriage and he ended up giving it to Karen. And that was the beginning of the end. They separated in 1921, just seven years after being married, and they divorced officially in 1925. So here Karen is at like the big age of 40. She's divorced. She's childless, syphilis ridden, running a farm by herself. Times were like really dark for her. And during this time, syphilis was like just really bad to have. It was not as easily cured or treated as it is today. So back then they were using like mercury and arsenic to treat syphilis. And her health was just like declining so badly that she had to return to Denmark for a year just to get like the proper medical treatment. For it. She couldn't really get that where she was in Kenya at the time. So once she gained enough strength, she did return to Kenya. She didn't start the actual divorce, like legal divorce proceedings against Bora just yet, but they weren't living together. They weren't speaking like they barely saw each other. They were living completely different lives, but things wouldn't stay like too dark for her for too long. Um, her luck changed when she met like a game hunter, a British game hunter, and this guy who was also training to be a pilot. His name was Dennis Finch Hatton. So within one year of separating from her husband, she finds a new bay. The girl's moving on. They dated for about two years, and he convinced Karen to let it go officially with Bora legally in 1925 so it was just like paperwork at this point because everyone knew her and Dennis were together they were not like hiding their relationship they had a very very public relationship and they lived together even on the farm and like he helped her out on the farm Dennis was really what she was looking for in her first marriage that she never got like that fantasy she wanted from Broer, Dennis became that. So they tried having babies, but because of her issues with syphilis, her body would just not conceive properly. And they had a very complex relationship. Um, they were kind of like swingers almost. I don't know. Like during this time, Nairobi was kind of a wild playground for colonial settlers who were looking to just like wild out, to be honest. The histories that I've read are very rare. Like that's a whole video in itself. But they weren't like being held accountable under this huge strict moral microscope that was in Europe. Like there was less eyes kind of watching. So it was easier to get nastier in the streets. So Nairobi had this area called Wanjahi Valley, also known as the Happy Valley set where many settlers lived and participated in like publicly accepted extramarital affairs, swinging parties, open marriages, drug use, like 
all this crazy stuff. And Karen was not directly involved with those type of things that took place in Happy Valley. But her lover, Dennis, definitely was like a big old freak, basically. So Dennis was rumored to have been having like ongoing relationships with another pilot who was famous at the time, Beryl Markham, throughout the entirety of his relationship with Karen. It was kind of like a don't ask, don't tell. Karen got pregnant with his baby in 1922, but she lost the baby because syphilis just had her so bad. And then Boris got pregnant with his baby in 1924 and she got an abortion because she's like, you know, we're not together. In 1926, Karen got pregnant again and lost that baby again. So it's almost like they were like a sister wives vibe. Like Karen knew he had someone else and she just didn't care. So not only did they have a volatile relationship that was full of drama and issues, um, unfortunately, our dude died in 1931 in a plane crash. Love just isn't working for Karen at this point. Like, it's actually pretty depressing. So not to mention the fact that a couple years after Dennis died in a plane crash, her ex-husband, Broer, died in a car crash. Like, the woman just had a lot going on. Like, it's traumatic. Almost, it's very traumatic. So in 1931, the location that she chose for the farm ended up not being totally ideal for harvesting. Her farm actually had like completely burned down at one point due to a fire. The climate wasn't really conducive to growing like the best coffee that she could in other places. And the Great Depression came into effect, causing her farm to go under like a lot of just like economic stress. Coffee prices began to plunge so low that it was really hard for her to make a profit. So she turned over her farm into a family corporation that now would like own the business and force her to sell the farm. And she ended up just like throwing in the towel and moving to Denmark. So she would never return back to Kenya due to health reasons. She's been quoted saying, <clears throat> if I know a song of Africa, I thought of the giraffe and the African new moon lying on her back on the plows in the fields and the sweaty faces of the coffee pickers. Does Africa know a song of me? It's pretty sad. So she started writing a lot of memoirs of Africa once she left. Um, she went home at 46, she's broke, single, heartbroken, dependent on her family for money, like basically back at square one. And she would depend on her family for money for the rest of her entire life. So after returning to Denmark, Karen immersed herself completely into her writing career. And that's kind of where it went up for her professionally. Her mobility was really, really low. Her energy was low. She couldn't get around so much. Like at this time, her body's completely deteriorating from syphilis. And she continued to just write to kind of like get her mind out of that. So she did create a new pseudonym, Isaac Dennison. And she just began writing a lot of like pieces of work under that name. So once again, women were not respected at this time. And she just felt like her work would be more taken seriously if people thought she was a man, which is really sad. So she loved to write books of like exoticism and supernatural occurrences but her most popular book was out of africa which she put under an alias as well so this came out in 1937 when she was 52 years old you guys it's never too late to start um thriving and she got world recognition for this book most of her earlier pieces of work were a lot different from out of africa and they never really like clicked with people but people loved out of africa and it ended up being nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize twice, but it lost two times. Um, the second time it lost to Ernest Hemingway, which I can like kind of understand, you know what I'm saying? He was like really, really good, but she never got the Nobel Peace Prize. But the book basically was like a narration of her life in Kenya. It talked about the differences between Africans and the Europeans that she met during this time. It talked about like the merging of their cultures. And it was just really poetic descriptions of the landscape of Kenya, the wildlife, and most controversially, 
the native people of Africa. So some critics have claimed that she kind of like objectified her servants and the people who were working for her on her farm throughout the book. Um, they felt like she pretty much looked down on anyone who was not necessarily like European in the book, like kind of sneak dissy vibes, like poetically sneaky rude at times. So I haven't read the book, so I can't really speak on it too much. But many have argued that throughout the book, Blixen used like animal imageries and like naturalesque, Africanesque, quote unquote, references to kind of like illustrate her point about the squatters who lived on her land and things like that. So the Kukuyu and Maasai communities were called like primitive and like a lock of sheep who were on friendly terms with destiny, basically saying like CP time, like niggas can't come to shit on time, basically. And she just accused them of not like having a plan for the future, being lazadaisical. This is a direct quote. Natives dislike speed as we dislike noise. It is to them at the best hard to bear. They are also on friendly terms with time. And the plan of beguiling or killing it does not come into their heads. In fact, the more time you can give them, the happier they are. And if you commission a Kikuyu to hold your horse while you make a visit, you can see by his face that he hopes you will be a long, long time about it. He does not try to pass the time then, but sits down and lives. You get what I'm saying? Like, it's kind of sneak busy. I don't, another quote. I turned to the animal world from the world of men. My heart was heavy with the tragedy of night. You turning from the animal world into the world of men. I don't know. I don't like it. Like... A lot of people just said that her book basically really reinforced like racial prejudice by portraying even like Somalians as more beautiful. So she talked about a Somalian who worked in her house named Farah and how she was like way more superior, smarter and more easy on the eyes than the other Africans around her, which are obviously Kenyans. But it was obviously, I mean, good enough for them to make it into a movie starring Meryl Streep that won seven Oscar Academy Awards. Never won the Nobel Peace Prize, but it did do really well as a movie. But the movie was like very loosely based on the book. But really a mix of rumors about Blixen's life and excerpts from different little pieces of work that she did even outside of Out of Africa were actually used to create the movie. So the movie had a lot of emphasis on her romantic relationships. In the book, Blixen didn't focus too much on her love life at all. Like she didn't mention any names of her lovers, um, but in the movie, it's heavily, heavily concentrated on her romantic life. So Hollywood knows what sells, like what's going to keep the people coming back, what's going to keep the people interested. So everyone loves a good romantic tragedy. So I feel like the writers kind of like focus on that more because the actual story may not have sold as well as if you focused on her love life, which was really the most fucked up part of it all. So in the movie, her first husband, Broer, is portrayed to be like a loser, like a womanizing loser, a leech. Someone who was just there for a good time, not a long time. Like it didn't focus on the talented aspects of him as like a safari guide or like any of the military accomplishments that he had had during his lifetime. But the book was a hit during its time. But in today's climate, I don't really think the book would fly. Like it would be kind of seen as problematic. Um, the white savior complex definitely rears its head in this book for show. A lot of Kenyans even were complaining when the movie came out because they felt like they were being underpaid. Like there's just a lot of mess that comes along with Karen in this situation. So even with the success of the book during that time, the effects of her taking arsenic and mercury for years did start to cause like mild and permanent loss of sensation in her legs. 
So she, her body started just kind of like slowly shutting down on her. She struggled with abdominal issues that would flare up whenever she was stressed. She suffered from panic attacks often as well, like depression. I'm sure the woman had PTSD. During the 1950s, around the time where she was like 65, she had to have like a piece of her stomach. I think it's like a third of her stomach removed due to an ulcer and it became impossible for her to even write. So she did kind of like do some radio broadcasts, like discussing her life in Kenya up until her health, discussing her life in Kenya up until her health rapidly deteriorated in 1962 and she died from starvation. Like her stomach operation did not work effectively and it was really hard for her to eat. So she became so skinny and emaciated that she literally died from starvation. So she also was a heavy smoker. So this didn't really help with the body health at all. This is before we knew like cigarettes were really bad for you. So she ended up dying at the age of 77 and leaving a strong legacy behind. So today in Nairobi, Kenya, she has a museum that is dedicated to her memory and an entire town named after her. I believe both of her husband's bodies are buried on that ground as well so well thank you guys for watching and joining i am doing this because i'm really trying to just like learn about african history y'all and throw it out there let me know what subjects you would like me to talk about next i'm bringing this to you guys every wednesday and thank you guys for watching so much mm -hmm.